Welcome to Life in the Leadership Lane. I'm Bruce Waller, your host, where I'm getting to talk to leaders that are making a difference in the workplace and in our communities. Uh, what did they do to get started and, and how are they continuing to accelerate in the leadership lane? And today I have a really, really special guest. Uh, we're going to get to hear from Lynn Shotwell. Lynn is the president and CEO of Worldwide ERC. Uh, Lynn has her GMS as well as her SHRM. SCP certification as well as her JD and listen she is uh, doing a lot of things for the HR and mobility community and I cannot wait to hear her story hey welcome to the show Lynn hey Bruce so uh, thank you for having me really excited to be here with you today well I'm excited to have you here as a matter of fact um, for those, so this is uh, on uh, Apple uh, Podcasts as well as Spotify, Google, different podcast platforms, but also on YouTube. And I am holding up my recent mobility magazine, um, and I love it. It says uh, it's the right time, and so I appreciate you spending your time with me today. And I would love for you to just uh, share a little bit about Worldwide ERC and. And what is Worldwide ERC for those who don't know, and, and how do you serve your customers? Great. So thanks, Bruce. Um, so Worldwide ERC is the Worldwide Employee Relocation Council. Um, so that's a little more explanative than Worldwide ERC. Um, but what we are is the world's largest association for people who work in the mobility industry. So whether they're in corporations or whether they're working with moving companies or real estate companies, um, immigration law firms, employment law firms, but it's all the people involved in helping employees move from one location to another, whether domestically or internationally. Yeah, that's fantastic and, and very important. I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm really excited to get into uh, Worldwide ERC, your role as the president and CEO as you started uh, right during the pandemic. So we're going to talk about yeah. that. But I would love for you to just start off uh, and just share the Lynn Shotwell story. I would love to hear like, where did you grow up? And how in the world did, get to, did you get to where you are today? So I think my, my background and my childhood really prepared me for where I am today. So I think the most important thing to know is that I had 11 houses in five states by the time I was 14 because my dad was in sales. And so this whole notion of picking up and moving for a job is something that I really grew up with. Um, and then, you know, since graduating from high school and being out on my own, I studied in France, I worked in Brazil, I've uh, lived in three additional states. So kind of, I, you know, I like to consider myself a citizen of the world. Um, I've lived all over the place. If, I, if you ask me to pick a home, it's Michigan. Um, because that's where I was born. That's where we moved back to in high school. It's what my parents always considered home. Um, and my family's still there and my husband's family. So it's the one kind of consistent in my life. I love that. Citizen of the world. You have, yeah. wow, you have traveled all over the world. That is fantastic. And yeah. talking about, you know, like what you're doing today in mobility, uh, what a great way, like all the experiences allows you to really help a lot of people. I think it helps me understand, you know, kind of the, the shoes that the uh, employees are in and, and at least their families are in. And so what I love about this position is it allows me to combine a couple of different interests, right? Because I am fascinated by employment law. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the whole question of as people are moving around the world and as there's new types of employment, you know, how at the end of the day, we just want everybody to do a good job and, and have a great experience. So how do we, how do I help the people that are trying to help their employees accomplish that and, and uh, you know, have a great career and then also advance the goals of the company? Um, it also really, to me, is so interesting because it's um, the international aspect's interesting. A um, little less focus on that right now. Well, I mean, a lot of focus on it, a little less movement in that area these days, but I think it's raising all sorts of new challenges. And then I think, you know, one of the things I'm really interested in is that as we have employees, even domestically, who are saying, you know what, I can work anywhere now. I'm gonna go work at my beach house. I'm gonna go work up in the mountains. I think it's gonna raise some of the same issues domestically that we've had to struggle with internationally because suddenly if you have employees who are working in another state, 
whose employment law covers them? Mm. You know, where, where is everybody going to pay taxes? And, you know, as we kind of come out of this recovery and governments are looking for taxes, is that going to become a bigger issue on the domestic stage, just like it is internationally? So we won't have the immigration issues, but we'll have a lot of the other issues that we struggle with uh, around the world. You know, that's interesting you brought that up because I think one of the things that was a hot topic even before uh, the, the pandemic was remote work. Yeah. And uh, many, you know, many people were advocating for that and others were saying, hey, no, we need to all be at the office. And then all of a sudden when this pandemic hit, uh, we all found a way to do that. And so we have this remote work world and everybody's now talking about, well, is it always going to be this way? And, you know, you know, now all of a sudden we're talking about, okay, well, what are the the laws that apply to that. And there's a whole lot more to it. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot more to it. And what I find so interesting is how all of us have just suddenly adopted to talking like this online and virtually, you know, we've gotten used to looking at ourselves <laughs> in little boxes on a screen. And, you know, as you know, I started March 30th and I still have not met most of my team in person. So uh, I've gotten really comfortable with the, with the Zoom calls. Oh my gosh. Well, let's talk about uh, your new role as the uh, president and CEO of Worldwide ERC. You're the leader. I, I'm just wondering, like, can you just share, like, what's that been like? I mean, you start, you just met, you started at the end of March. You haven't met many of your, your team members, but so you, you come in, you're, you're the leader of the like largest mobility association in the world. Um, what's that like? And then, and then what's your, like, what's your, like, do you, do you put, together like a hundred day plan, like you hear the presidents <laughs> put together. What does that look like? So, so kind of coming in, it, you know, it was such an interesting time, right? Because I started and, and the board had made the decision to close the office before I arrived. And they had made the decision that we were going to take our May conference online. So I didn't have to step in and make those hard decisions. So, but, you know, I think back in March, we all thought, oh, this will be over in a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so. <laughs> Um, so it's been really a learning experience in terms of figuring out how do you build a team? How do you get to know a team and my members virtually? Um, and so, you know, you asked about a hundred day plan. So when I uh, had my final interview for this job in January, I had to present a hundred day plan. What would I do to implement the board's strategic plan that they had adopted? So um, I think the four areas I told them I would focus on, I still have. I've just had to go about it in a different way. So. You know, my, my 100 day plan was I had, to, I had to do four things. I had to get to know my people, right? Um, so I had to get to know what are their strengths? What, um, what do they do? How can, they, how can we really build a more cohesive team? So I've had to now figure out how to do that in a virtual environment. Um, the second thing is I had to get my arms around our money. Um, so, you know, where are we, where's our revenue coming from? Where are our expenses? And this has been a, a much greater challenge than I thought it would be simply because some of our major sources of revenue, which are our conferences, we had to cancel conferences around the world and we've had to shift to online. So that's been a, that's been a real challenge, but again, staying focused on that. Um, the third piece was getting to know my members and again, uh, doing it, but trying to figure out how do I get to know them virtually? So before I started, I had a great plan for some of the events I was going to host at our May conference and at the October conference and who I was going to invite in and how I was going to get to meet people. Um, so now we've shifted and it's gone online. So we're hosting some virtual roundtables and trying to do more events like this one. Um, had a great meeting with uh, the Relocation Directors Council, a, a Zoom call. Uh, a week or two ago where I, I got to know them a little bit. Um, you know, it's harder to have that interactive dialogue, so I'm still looking for ways to do that, but really focus on in this environment, what do we need to give our members today? Because again, I think that's different than what it was in January, what our members need from us to help them through this really tough time. Um, and then my final area was my board of directors. You know, they're my bosses, so uh, really important. I keep them happy, but also, you know, just working with them to put good governance in place, make sure that uh, we recruit new leaders to the organization. We're in the final stages of uh, the, uh, figuring out who we're going to uh, have on our 2021 board. We had an incredibly strong uh, array of candidates, so it's, it's been a good problem to have, but, but it's but tough decisions. I'm sure we're going to end up in a great place. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh. Man, I, I, I got to tell you, I can't even imagine how challenging that's been to come in 
uh, as a leader, but I think, you know, honestly, just from my uh, observation, it looks like you've done a nice job navigating. For example, uh, I serve on the North Texas Relocation Professionals Board, and you've already come to the North Texas Relocation Group, yeah. and we, we've had a call, and we're talking about, you know, how we can serve uh, worldwide ERC and the, and the global conference, and we're excited to do that. And so, you know, just that right there, um, allowing us to get to know you a little bit more and connecting and how we can serve you, I think also um, it is, uh, has helped us too uh, as well. And, and one of the things I always ask is, you know, how can, how can you as a leader, how do you generate that momentum? Because I, I think really that's what it's all about, right? It's about mm -hmm. how can we get some momentum to get everybody moving in one direction? Yeah, so with, with my team, I've, I've tried to approach that a couple of different ways. I mean, first of all, I had one-on-one -on -one conversations with everybody. Um, and, and I'm taking it kind of in, I'd say, six to eight-week chunks. So we had a plan that took us through um, Labor Day or Memorial Day and then kind of through the 4th of July. You know, you're using the holidays to say, okay, let's experiment with how we're going to meet as a group. Um, we just came off from mid-July through Labor Day. I had my team meeting every single day. Um, four days a week, it was for a half an hour, and we had dedicated topics every day. One day a week, it was two hours. Um, at the end of that, we did a survey and said, all right, what did you think of this? Um, and not surprisingly, everybody's like, oh, too many meetings. <laughs> I agreed. Um, but it did improve communications. And so now we're, we're pivoting and we're going back to having kind of a different cadence going on. And I think what we're learning as I talk to my team is everybody misses that kind of casual interactions you get in the office where you can pop your head up and say, Hey, does anybody know about this? Or, you know, just kind of it. So you have to find other ways to facilitate those interactions and conversations, or it can be very isolating, I think, for some of the employees. Yeah, I think, uh, man, you are right on there. I mean, it's like, you know, we're missing that, hey, give me a high five because something good just happened or, yeah. or whatever that is. Um, I'm always curious uh, as a leader and, and uh, to, I was wondering, can you share uh, in your opinion, like what are some high, like what are some common threads to like high performing teams? I mean, we talk about that. How do we, how do we, all, I mean, especially in this yeah. time, I mean, there's still probably some, some things that we can do. Uh, and, and this is not only for people that are leading teams, but people who are also part of that team. Like what are some, uh, in your opinion, what are some of those common threads for these to have that high performing team? So, so there are three values that we're really working on as a team. Um, and part of this arose because we had to um, do some reorganization like many organizations have. So I have fewer employees than I did uh, on March 30th. Um, and so everybody has taken on more responsibility and in some cases completely different roles. So we're, we're, we're talking about three different values. Um, and we have these conversations when we meet as a team. So the first one is all in, what we call mm -hmm. all in. And that means we all have to be willing to jump in and help out wherever the organization most needs it. So for example, we have our virtual conference coming up. That's something that's gonna require everybody to be, take part in because we have to make it successful. So you know, your job might not normally involve dealing with virtual conferences, but nobody's did so, or, or you know, very few did. So we all have to uh, be all in and making sure that we succeed at our goals. The second thing is communication. And we cannot, as particularly in this environment, overemphasize how important it is to let everybody know what you're doing and repeat it and to communicate out in different ways. You know, we'll talk about things in a team meeting, but then to follow it up with an email and maybe over communication cannot happen right now. I think there's just, it's so hard when we're all dispersed and we're all figuring out how to work in this new world. And then the last thing is we have to hold each other accountable. And mm -hmm. so my team has been working on developing their own goals that are aligned with our organization goals. And then they share those out. Um, so everybody knows what everyone else's priorities and goals are. And then we talk about it. Are you making progress towards it? Um, do you need help? That's the other thing that goes back to the all in. If somebody's struggling, why are they struggling? Um, is it, you know, can we give somebody else back them up and give them that support? I love so, that. I love so those that. are the three things we're really working on. Yeah, I love, I love that, especially when you threw in there, hey, and if you need help, by the way, that's, we want to help. Um, being all in, communication, 
and um, accountability. Well, accountability. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh man, that is so good. I love that. Um, let, let's talk about let's talk about this pivoting here. This this yeah. worldwide ERC global symposium. Yeah. You talked about when you came in, you didn't have to make the, the difficult decision because you already right. uh, chose to have that virtually for the. Uh, I believe that was the Americas conference at the time, or, yeah. or the Spring conference. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the like this symposium. I mean, this is typically this is a big big conference every year. Yeah. Uh, talk about like what is that going to look like now that. Um, uh, we're, we've already decided we're going to we're going to pivot to this virtual conference uh, in October, I think. Right. It is in October. So we're actually calling it Mobility Month um, because when we decided to pivot um, and we went out and we purchased a platform to host a virtual event, we thought, you know what, we didn't just cancel the GWS that was going to be in Washington, D.C. This fall, we also canceled conferences in Tokyo, in Rio, in mm -hmm. Delhi, and in Singapore, or, and in Shanghai, right? So we were going to be all around the world. So then it, the question becomes, all right, if we have a platform that allows us to ignore kind of time and space barriers, what are we going to do with it? So we decided we would have mobility months. Um, and what we've done is we've create, re, we've tried to recreate what we were going to do all fall in a virtual environment. So the very first week, which starts October 28th, it's going to be focused more or less on what we would have done had we met in Washington, right? So it's going to be general global mobility topics. The second week um, falls right after, or is the week of the election. So that's when we're going to host our government affairs forum. Normally we would host them before GWS, but we're going to host uh, our forums that week, hopefully We'll have some idea how the election turns out and they'll be able to give their insights on, okay, in this new world, what are our uh, policy pri priorities going to be? The third week is our international week. So we have one day devoted to EMEA, one day to APAC, and one day to Latin America. And we will host the live portions of those events in the, in the time zones, in the regional time zones, so that you know, we're the ones getting up in the middle of the night, not people in Asia. Um, but everything will be recorded. So if you're here and you know you want to listen in, you can listen to it on your own time zone, which is what I love about this. And then the last week, we come back, and it's the week before Thanksgiving, and we close again with kind of um, bringing everything together, uh, again, having topics more like we would normally have it at GWS. Um, this this platform that we've got is is actually, I'm really excited about it. You'll have, you'll walk You'll have like a little avatar, but you'll walk into a, a, what looks like a convention center. Go off to one side is the exhibit hall. So we have exhibitors who are going to be there and have booths, and they'll have the ability in their booths to have videos, to hand out materials, to have live chats with you. Um, go into another direction, and it's the conference session. So uh, we'll have a mix. Some things will be actually held live. Some things will be simulized. So we record it in advance, but it's accompanied by a live chat. Some things will be pre-recorded. Um, and then, you know, and some things will be what we're just putting in what we're calling the resource center. So they might not be kind of a featured session on the agenda, but we're going to have additional topics that will just be available um, for anybody to watch that will be pre-recorded. Um, and then finally, in the platform, there's a networking lounge. So oh. there will be times for everybody to go in and just have chats with whoever else happens to be in the networking lounge. Uh, there'll be certain times that we say, okay, we're having a, a chat about a particular topic. Um, and, uh, and then we're also exploring, I don't, I don't know if we're going to do this yet, but we uh, may be able then to also have kind of just some Zoom happy hours. So we have people sign up, break up into groups and, and do something fun. I mean, we're trying, to, we're trying to do our best to recreate some version of the fun that comes along with our events as well. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's what that's what we're all we're all wanting education. We're all, we all want to get better. Um, I love the networking lounge; just a chance for you yeah. to like connect, right? That's what we're m many of us are, are looking for: is how can we connect with others and talk about you know what's going on in in mobility in our world. Also, love how you talked about you know I was personally think of it from the U.S. viewpoint, like the yeah. global mobility, you know, the global symposium. Uh, but yeah, you've caught, you've had to cancel these conferences all around the world. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you're bringing that to everyone. Oh man, mobility yeah. month. Okay. Yeah. A couple of things. One, um, 
we, uh, the North Texas Relocation Professionals is actually having a meeting this week and we're going to record that meeting and we're going to make that part of the mobility month. So that's going to be fantastic. Yeah, we have a, a corporate panel. It's going to be so good. We're going to talk <laughs> about yesterday, today, and tomorrow, how that it just, yeah. it's just different. Um, what about um, sponsors? Will sponsors still be able to be engaged in your event? Absolutely. Yep. And, and so we're talking to all of the sponsors who signed up last year to, to exhibit this year and saying, all right, join us in this virtual environment. And they're, they're excited. I think they're also trying to figure out how to use this new platform, but it allows sponsors to do some new and interesting things as well. So they can have videos uh, in their booth. They can have live chats in their booth. Um, you know, again, they can record sessions and put it in our resource center or in their booth. So, you know, it's a new world for all of us, but we're trying to figure it out. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm excited about that just because uh, I've been to uh, a couple of different uh, virtual conferences and both times it seems like uh, the sponsored videos were able to, like you could like, it, 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 there was more of an experience and getting to know them a little bit more. So knowing that they'll be able to have videos and, yeah. and be able to have, uh, generate that experience, I, I think that's pretty special too. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Oh man. So, okay. So that's going to start October the 28th and it's going to go for a month. I mean, mobility month, right? Yep. October 28th to November 20th. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. Oh my. Um, and then, so I'm part of North Texas relocation. So I'm assuming uh, all of the different regional groups are going to do something or I get many, many of them are. Yep. Okay. So yeah. one of the things I'm actually excited about, I talked about that connecting with members. Um, and so last week I actually launched what uh, we're calling the leadership round table, but it's bringing together the presidents and vice presidents and other leaders from all of the different regional uh, relocation councils. And so uh, we are talking about how do we collaborate more and, you know, again, love to invite all of them to submit sessions. I don't know if I, my team might not like if I get all of them, <laughs> it's a lot of work to load these, these sessions up, but we're doing our best, right? So. Uh, I love that because every time I talk to another um, board member from another uh, a group, uh, for example, I was talking to Jack Jampel out of Delaware not yeah. too long ago. And I'm always we're always asking like, you know, what are you doing for your programs or what are you doing for the, and we're always, you know, collaborating and brainstorming. So I, I love the fact that you, you're doing that. Um, well, I, and I think for the regional leaders, I think one thing as, as the regional leaders know, and as my team knows, it is not less work to put on a virtual event than it is an in person. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I give all of you credit too, for doing your day jobs and then volunteering to help figure out how to put on these events and, keep the networking and the connections going at a local yeah. level. No, uh, you're right. You're right. It's, it's just as much work. I want to just real touch real quick on. So uh, I just, I mentioned, I just got my mobility magazine. Um, and this is the, the magazine put up, uh, ERC uh, puts out. Um, and you write a column um, yeah. and it was titled the right time. And I just, I love this because um, it talks about, I'm going to just put on my glasses here, but it talks about uh, lifelong learning has become even more of an economic imperative. I talk a little bit about the importance of, of the right time and, and, and the importance of upskilling. So one of the things I was really involved in um, when I was at uh, the Society for Human Resource Management was working on an international level to say, like, how do we make sure that we are preparing everyone for the jobs of the future? So We've been talking for a number of years about lifelong learning and the fact that, you know, skills become obsolete. And so we all have to continually upgrade what we're doing in our, in our skills. And it doesn't mean going back to college. And in fact, there are a lot of jobs today that don't require it. But how do you acquire those new skills? You know, I was reading this morning about TikTok and I, I'm like, I, I really probably need to figure that out at some point, right? But how do you keep your skills fresh? How do you always be moving forward? And I think you know, the pandemic is a, per, a, a great time for us all to think about that because certainly we've had the unfortunate situation that some people have lost their jobs. So, you know, how do they gain skills to stay fresh and to re-enter the labor market? And then for anybody who's in the labor market already, what are the new things we have to do beyond kind of figuring out how to communicate with, with Zoom? But, you know, we know that data 
is going to continue to play an even more important part of, of, of all of our jobs. We're going to have to understand the dynamics, you know, whether they're economic or social dynamics that are, are going on in our industry. So how do you keep fresh on that? You know, what are, what are the other new um, emerging technologies that you can use to streamline and, and improve your operations? One of the things I've done at ERC is we have, um, we are taking a lot of our accounting and finance functions and moving them online and moving them to the cloud and really streamlining the processes that we had in place. So we can use all of this to work much smarter and more efficiently than we have in the past. But all of it takes, you know, it takes an initiative on your on, on every one of our parts to kind of keep fresh and, and keep moving forward. One of the things I'm doing and I uh, is I'm actually sitting for my CRP. You talked about the other things that we're doing. Um, and, and so, you know, ERC, off, we, we offer the certified relocation professional designation. Um, I will never be an expert in that area, but I need to understand what we can offer that segment of our membership. So I'm studying for the exam and committed to taking that in November as well. <laughs> <laughs> as if you have uh, enough things on your plate. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, um, I'm glad you said that. Uh, because uh, I always talk about the importance of upskilling. I think that is so, so important. I, I give a lot of presentations after I wrote my book, Find Your Lane. I always talk about the importance of you just got to keep upskilling. And you mentioned that about the CRP. When I was a president of Dallas HR, um, the third largest Sherm chapter in the country in, here in Dallas, um, I remember at the time I did not have my certification. I remember our study group was always sold out. And I felt like as a president, I needed to learn more about that. And so I took my certification and, and, and got my PHR and then Sherm CP. And, and it's all about, and I tell people all the time, it, it's, yes, it's nice to have it. Yes, when you get done, it is so good. But it's the process. Going through that process, you learn and grow like no other. Absolutely. And, and for me, I have to understand. So I'm using the same study materials as our members would, would use. And when I got the GWS, when I was interviewing for this too, it gave me some insights about, okay, there's some things I would improve on this. And I was so excited to get uh, into this role and figure out my team was way ahead of me. They, you know, they'd already uh, started uh, uh, redeveloping it or launching the new version. So we're getting ready to launch a new version of our G G uh, global mobility specialist soon too. All these acronyms in this world. <laughs> There's a lot of them. <laughs> oh my gosh, I absolutely love that. Oh my gosh. So um, I always, I always like to um, ask, you know, people that have had success during their career. I, I would, I would love to ask you. Um, were there some like, were there some mentors along the way uh -huh. that that was able to help you through the process? Could you share a little bit about the importance of mentorship? Oh, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. There were, I mean, some key people in my life, but I'm going to, I'm going to start with my dad. Um, and I still call him and bounce business issues off of him because he's just always been supportive of everything I want to do and very thoughtful. And he can approach things from a, a, a different perspective. You know, he worked in agriculture, in the agriculture industry. So it's not the same world at all, but he, you know, he gets the business issues. Um, but kind of, you know, two other people who were huge in, in, in as mentors to me. One is Austin Fragaman. So he was the chairman of the board of ACIP, which the American Council on International Personnel, um, which really was my entry into the association world. And, you know, it was an association of immigration professionals. And he's been just so incredible over the years in helping me uh, navigate how to run an association, but then also really... Uh, how to think about and put business strategy with immigration laws and policies. So mm -hmm. really, really grateful to him. And then the other person I'd say is I model kind of how I try to interact with my staff is an attorney I worked with uh, when I first graduated. His name was Bob Waters. Um, he's passed on now, but a super nice guy, but he taught me patience. He was so patient with me. And when I wrote something and wasn't quite right, um, I worked with other attorneys who made you feel really bad about the work that you did, but he never did that. He was patient and helped you improve your work and, and talk you through it. So give him a lot of credit for how I, how I try to work, interact with my team. You know, I talk a lot about, um, you know, when people talk about setting goals, I always talk about the importance of setting who goals instead of what do you want to accomplish? Who do you want to be? 
Um, and when you talk about Bob and you talk about patience, all of a sudden now you're like, that's like who I want to be. I want to be, I want to lead and I want to, I want to show others the importance of patience. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that. you know, and, and, you know, Boston's can be tough places. So there, I got a lot of examples there too, of who I didn't want to be. That became very clear to me. So. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting you say that too, because I've talked to a lot of people and I, I talk about, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot is networking. I just think that it's so important to build your network and, um, I tell people all the time, you get to see what good looks like, but you also get to see what not good looks like. And yeah. I think there's some value in that along the way. Oh, that's fantastic. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier about find your lane. I always like to ask that the question too, is like, how did you like, how did you know, like you, you're going, like you're interviewing for this position. You want to be the president CEO, you know, where you want to go and what you want. How did you, how did you know that? Was there a time where you're like, this is what I want to do. This was what I have been working for my whole life. Was there like something in particular that you said, Hey, or, or, or was that just over time or, or what made you want to be, you know, a leader? A leader. So, um, you know, I think I've always been a leader. It was called bossy when I was a little girl, but, um, <laughs> I think, but no, look, I always, I like to help move things in a new direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, as I think about how I evolved to get where I am with, with this job, I mean, I talked about my childhood, so it's very natural to me that I'm interested in kind of helping people move. And I think the ability to move around the world should be open, right, for careers. And, and kind of how I've come to some of that was, you know, I, after college, I worked, um, I, I did an internship in Brazil. I later learned when I got to law school that I'd worked illegally and I thought, wow, um, I didn't, didn't even know that was a thing. Right. Um, and so my heart is there when I started working at HR at Oldsmobile it was the same thing. Like, how do you help people be successful in what they do and in their, in their jobs and in their interactions? You know, uh, in law school, I was always much more interested in the courses that kind of dealt with people. So family law, immigration, employment than I was about, then I was interested in the money issues, the contracts and the property law. Um, because to me, I like that human interaction and I want to see other people uh, succeed. So this, you know, my evolution in going from leading an immigration association to an HR association to this is all very natural because they're all connected in that in each case, the community of people that I'm working with, they're all people people, which I really, really like. Um, you know, I love it when you go to these conferences and see everybody hugging and connecting and they have, you know, their own secret language, whether it's immigration acronyms or mobility acronyms or HR, but they all are really good people. And so that's part of what attracted me to ERC. Yeah, I, I tell people all the time that when I go to a conference, a worldwide ERC conference, I feel like I'm going to like a uh, a high school reunion or some type of reunion because as soon as you get there everybody's just, it's all like family and friends it's there's just nothing like that so I appreciate you yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. that's fantastic um you know we talk about leadership we're talking about leading your team but I want to talk about leading yourself for a minute you know leadership <laughs> like leadership is hard um yeah. but uh, but to me it seems like leaders that have had success seem to have a daily practice or they have daily practices that they do every day. And I, I was just wondering if you could just share, do you have like a daily practice or some daily practices that you use every day? Um, and what, what's a day in the life look like for Lynn? Like when you get up to the time you call it a day, I would love for you to just share that. So, I mean, certainly the pandemic has been so interesting, right? Because now there is a much more typical day than I ever had before. I mean, uh, the fact that I have, no, I've been home for six months, that's incredible. Um, and so I have, I have worked hard to establish a routine. Um, I work out more than I ever, more consistently than I ever have, which is great. So I get up and um, when I was at Sherm, we had a, a a trainer that came in and did boot camp a couple times a week. And so he's taken his courses online. So I'm there 6:30 in the morning, a couple days a week doing that. Um, also do yoga a couple days a week. Mm -hmm. And I always walk. We have a, we have a great dog and you know, he gets lots of walks, but I need as a, you know, to kind of keep my balance. I need to spend time outside. 
So, mm. um, when I, you know, when I work out, it's usually outside because I take my laptop outside and entertain the neighbors with what I'm doing on the porch. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it, to me, that's really important to connect with nature and to, to spend that time. Um, so that's kind of how I start my days. Um, have always ended my days by reading. I love to read, uh, usually nonfiction because it just is in a, or usually fiction, I'm sorry, because it's an escape, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something yep. to kind of take my mind off the day before I, before I go to bed. Um, the, you know, in between, a lot of Zoom calls, right? A mm -hmm. lot of Zoom calls, but I do try to build in um, a, at least a couple of afternoons of just blocks of quiet time where I can focus and say, okay, how do I take all these scraps of notes on my desk and put them into something that will help me figure out what I really need to be doing and to keep and to get me refocused on the things that really matter. Yeah, that's fantastic. Oh man, that, that's great. I love that. Uh, working out. I mean, it's, 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 it's easy to just go start doing the work. It's hard to like, okay, I've got to work out first, but if you can make that, yeah. I tell people all the time, if you can just take care of yourself first, make that part of your discipline, the rest of the day will, will go much, much better. It's so I love so much better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I just got through running this morning. I didn't want to run today and I just like, I have to run. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, before we kind of get into to the life part, I'd love, you know, you shared a lot today. I would just love for you to share just some advice that you've maybe been given over the years that you share with others or, or, or some advice that you would share for others to, um, I don't know, whether it's encourage them or help them uh, with success along the way? Mm, okay. um, I think one of the pieces of advice, two, two things that, that I, I was told pretty early in my career, and one was um, always contribute to a meeting. So don't ever just go to a meeting and not say anything. Um, and you might not always have the most brilliant insights and you shouldn't talk just to talk. But if you listen hard enough, you can find some way that you have something interesting to add to that conversation. So I, I try to mentor younger people to do that. Um, I'm also a, a big believer in, in networking. And again, it's a little harder to do today, but I, I often tell the younger people who are thinking about something about a career direction, I say, well, then go out and join that at professional association or find a local group to network with and see, see if you like the people you meet, number one, and are they talking about things that are interesting to you? Um, because to me, it's, it's so important that if you're getting up and you're doing a job every day, you should want to read the trade press from that. It should be interesting to you. And if it's not, then that's probably an indication that that's maybe not the right place for you. Oh, that's fantastic. I love the uh, contributing to the conversation in the meeting. I remember uh, back in 2004 when I joined Armstrong, I was 37 years old at the time, and I was the young guy. There was like a dozen... <laughs> people around the room and they would go around the room and, and, and different people would talk. And I was just wanting to hear from them because I was the young guy. I thought, you know, I'm just going to soak it in. Um, and now that I'm the old guy, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm wanting to hear what the young people have to say. Yeah. And so I think that's so important uh, what you said there. And I think there's a lot of people that are going to get a lot out of, a lot out of that. That's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And especially the networking. Um, I also talk about, you know, you talk, I'm glad you said that about the networking because um, I think today networking, yes, it, it probably is more challenging, but the strategies have not changed. I tell people all the time, you still have to show up. You still have to engage. You still have to be, find a way to be a resource and follow up, right? You can do that. Absolutely. Maybe it's on LinkedIn. Well, you know, and, and also I think as you, as you advance in your career and you get to more senior levels, one of the questions I ask people I'm interviewing is, who's your personal board of directors? So you asked me earlier about mentors, but to me, it goes beyond that. So like, all right, when you're having a, a bad day or struggling, who are the people you're going to call on? And I, and I think if you, you know, for most of us, it goes back to some of those connections we made early in our career, right? It's the people you really trust to give you good advice. Um, and, you know, and you've known them for a long time. They know you, you can be honest with them. Um, but again, it's a safe space to go and bounce ideas around and everybody that's, needs to develop that. That's fantastic. I love that. Okay. Personal board of directors, write that down. That yeah. is absolutely gold. I love that. Thank you uh, so much. L listen, 
Um, I want to, uh, man, there's so much more I want to <laughs> learn from you, but we, we're kind of getting to the end of the show. So I want to uh, go to what I call it's time to accelerate. Um, and I just want to ask you a few questions as we kind of conclude the interview. Um, first question, uh, I know that you mentioned reading earlier, but, but book or podcast? Books. But all the way. Yeah. So uh, I listen to podcasts, but books. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you, you like, you said you like um, fiction. Mostly, kind of... mostly fiction. Um, so last year I read 26 books. I keep track of them. Oh. Um, have a little competition with a friend. I'm in two book clubs. Um, so okay. this year my goal is to beat that. But some nonfiction, but mostly, fic mostly fiction. That's fantastic. I uh, actually started a book club a couple of years ago and we have it online. It's called Climb. Stands for yeah. Connect, Lead, Inspire, Mentor, and Build. And um, so we're kind of keeping track. So we're reading Everybody Matters right now, Bob Chapman. So uh, oh, that's fantastic. I'll check it out. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, for sure. Now I know uh, who can I exchange book yeah. ideas with. Okay. How about uh, favorite food? Uh, anything Mediterranean. Love the whole food from that region. Love it. Love it. Um, what energizes you, Lynn? Um hanging out with a small group of friends. I mean, and I think this, you know, again, this pandemic has taught, it, it really has helped us all refocus. And what I miss the most is um, just having dinner with, you know, four to six people, having, hanging out in the backyard, because I, you just, you relax, it energizes me. And, you know, luckily we're able to start doing a little bit of that again. Yeah, for sure. I love that. That's, that's fantastic. I'm with you on that. How about, you know, you mentioned earlier, you've been home for six months and you, you're you accustomed to traveling a lot. Was yeah. there a favorite place that you've traveled to or is there a favorite place that you want to travel mm -hmm. to? So where I've traveled, it's like asking me to pick my favorite child because I love every <laughs> place I go. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I was super fortunate that uh, we did a family trip right before all of this to Rome and Venice, which was my first time there. And I think Rome is my new favorite city. Um, love Greece as well. But I, for me, it's anything where you combine kind of where it's history. And Rome was amazing because you had so many levels and layers of history. And of course, the food's great. Um, and, you know, and the other thing is beaches. It was, December, the beaches didn't matter so much. But if you can kind of combine all that scenery and food and history, it's amazing. Greece, and that's why I also love Greece. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, man. That's fantastic. So I got one final question that I want to ask you, and I, I love asking this question. Um, and, he, and here's the question, Lynn. T Lynn, 10 years older, what is she saying if she's knocking at your door today? What is she telling you? That you got through this, right? That we all got through this really tough time. And um and that this pause that we had wasn't a bad thing because it made, gave us all chance to like, I think both reprioritize and I hope that we can use it as a way to reimagine how we make the world a better place. Um, you know, it'd be a shame if we kind of, everybody talks about going the next normal. And I am hopeful that we can recreate both our, our businesses and our jobs to be different than they were before, but better in many ways. That's fantastic. I absolutely love that. You are definitely driving in the leadership lane. Yeah. If people wanted to connect you with, with you or also uh, learn more about the conference, like, can you just share uh, also how would they get registered if they wanted to join uh, the, sure. the, the, uh, the Mobility Month conference? So the best way to get uh, conference information is our website. So worldwide ERC, spell it all out, dot org. Um, and they'll under events or right in on the top of the page, you should be able to find information about registering for the conference. Have a great rate this year, uh, 250 with a discount if you bring multiple people from your company. So, you know, we've priced this recognizing kind of the situation everybody's in this year. So that's the best way to do that. Um, connect with me. Um, I'll be honest, the fastest way is email. You can also try LinkedIn. Uh, don't check it as often as I should probably, but uh, either, either one of those ways. Well, I, I appreciate you just sharing your, your wisdom. I'm going to put uh, all that information in the show notes so people that are listening or people that are watching can just go down to the notes and click on that Terrific. link and they can get there quickly. Um, it's been an absolute honor oh. um, and a pleasure to just have a conversation with you and just to learn more about you, Lynn. And I just want to say 
how much I appreciate you just sharing your, your wisdom and your perspectives. And I look forward to uh, just watching you lead uh, Worldwide ERC for years to come. Well, thank you, Bruce. This has been really fun, and uh, I hope we can do it again sometime. For sure. Okay, have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye.